Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome one and all of you to pretty much where it all begins. Now, I must be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, just before we get started. You see this layout you're doing where we're doing right now? Uh, in future videos, this is not going to last because technically I'm all caught up with all of the Chris Chat videos. I've made videos for every single one to date apart from part one. Now, there's a very good reason for this. I originally did wanted to do like part one of this video, but there were certain uh, litigations involving my channels getting deleted elsewhere. However, there's going to be a system in place in which I think I can get them back. But for the meantime, however, we're going to start pretty much where it all began, where it all started to go wrong. Now, if you have a, if you don't know anything at all about Christian Western Channel, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to find out. So, with all that being said and done, if you guys want to check out the original videos for yourselves, links will all be in the description down below. It is made by Mr. Gino Samuel. I very much appreciate his work. Absolutely spot on content. And get ready, ladies and gentlemen. If you're watching this right now, this is the rabbit hole. And we're about to dive headfirst into it. Seriously, like, lying... It, remember the remember the uh, the Netflix drama Lion King or whatever it was. Well, no, I, it's 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 ironic how one of these things has lasted. But uh, let's get started. Part one, in three, two, one, and the content is made with the intention of informing and educating inquisitive persons oft about an often controversial figure. By presenting a detailed, factual account of events within, with minimal spin or twisting of the facts to the best of my abilities. Neither I, Gino Samuel, nor the video itself condone any hostile actions addressed herein and discourage contact, especially that of a malicious nature. With any person featured in this video, copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use. For purposes such as criticism, comment, news, reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright stature that might otherwise be infringing. Additional warning. The following video addresses mature themes which may not be suitable for younger audiences. I'll say this in future videos, but I'm really glad that you did this. Really mature this, uh, Mr. Mr. Samuel. You're about to find out why. <coughs> Hello ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, and dudes of all teenagers, as well as the uh, gals. My name is Christian Chandler, I am here, and y'all are there. Christian. Arguably the most documented person in history. His antics have been witnessed by millions with many always keeping a close eye on him, waiting to see what he does next. All he did was make me feel sad and depressed. He should love his mother. She misses him. Hello, we're live on the internet. What do you want? Hi, Mom, hello. I love the women outside. Do not hate. Hate is not so good. <sighs> I want everything about my house off the internet! What made him this way? What is the attraction? What keeps us fascinated? This is the story of Chris Chan. Part 
part one. Also, uh, just a little bit of additional information for me because there are channels like this one, but there are also dozens of channels out there that talk extensively about the things Chris has been up to in the past. And one of the things you're going to find out is that there were some very, very conflicting things about Chris. And it's probably better if you have some sort of like uh, introduction through Chris. This is not ideally the best way to be introduced through Chris through the method I'm doing. But it is it is what it is. And uh, let's just get to it. Christopher Weston Chandler was born on February 24th, 1982 in Charlottesville, Virginia to parents Bob, aged 54, and Barbara, 40. Bob had worked in the engineering field for Western Electric and later General Electric. The family held Bob's life accomplishments very proudly, as he had at least seven patents to his name, including mechanisms used in the production of Kleenex and molding of plastic water containers. Bob was very world conscious and was an avid collector of stamps since a very young age. Later in life, he developed a love for music, especially foreign music. He eventually amassed a collection of over 10,000 vinyl records. He had a son and daughter from a previous marriage, the relationships with whom were strained to say the least. Barbara was the secretary with Virginia Power. She had a habit of hoarding her belongings and was an emotionally abusive person, which convinced her then 17-year-old son, Cole Smithy, to seek independence and live life on his own. So when Chris came along, Bob and Barb got a chance to start anew. The new family started their new life in their humble Ruckersville home. Chris later claimed that at around two months of age, he uttered his first word, monkey. It didn't take long for the parents to see that Chris wasn't quite like most other babies. The first signs of his autism could be witnessed in 1983. Despite his condition being congenital, he had stated that his autism was brought about by one particularly traumatic event when he was 18 months old. A babysitter named Roach, or Roach, would look after baby Christopher whenever his parents would go out in the evenings. One of these nights, Chris inadvertently infuriated her, and she locked him in a room filled with toys, in the dark, alone. This would prove so traumatic that he refused to speak for the next six years. Even though he sees this event as the source of all his troubles, he does not blame his parents for keeping Roach as his babysitter, for they did not know better. Despite living out his childhood as a mute, Chris was anything but quiet. He confessed later on in life that he screeched often and was very troublesome to his parents. In 1985, the Hammer household moved into the neighborhood. The Hammers and the Chandlers struck up a cordial relationship which led to Chris forming a bond with the Hammer's daughter, Sarah. Looking back, Chris considered her to be... Also, one other thing. Uh, if you were to tell me that perhaps somebody, maybe let's say 8 or 9 years old, or possibly even 10, uh, did this drawing of, um, of Sarah Hammer here, well, I'm just going to say this much. I know fine well it, Chris was not 10 when he did this. I think he was somewhere near 20 when he drew this. Now again, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, you know, Picasso uh, by contrast, but you know, you, you got to start somewhere. Is basically what I'm saying. Be his closest childhood friend, and that she greatly helped him with his autism. However, from what is known of their relationship, it is also likely that she took advantage of Chris's innocence and trust, and may be seen more as a bully than a friend. For example, she once told him that Casper, the friendly ghost, was hiding under her house. Naturally. Chris crawled into the hammer's crawl space to find him, only to find spiderwebs, bugs, and dirt instead. Sarah locked him in. After about half an hour, her dad came to his rescue. On another occasion, she told Chris that if he were to eat the upper thing of a honeysuckle, it would taste like honey. This is a reference to the berries of a honeysuckle, which can be slightly harmful if ingested in large doses. Fortunately, their parents told them of the dangers of doing so before Christopher could fulfill Sarah's wish. At the age of five, Chris began studying at Green County Primary School together with Sarah. It is not known how he was treated here or how he got along with the other kids. In addition to taking regular classes at the primary school, he received language training at James Madison University. 
in 1987, in a lengthy letter addressed to Chris, dated December 26th, Bob offered his outlook on life and presented some life advice for his son. There are many sides to a mountain and many ways to climb it. If you get stopped, back off, regroup, and try another way. If you are still not successful, maybe it is not meant to be. If it is meant to be, having it on the back burner simmering for a while is not bad. It will pop up again, and the way to attain it will be there. Everything in its time. Your mother and I have done our best for you, and in return, we expect at least that from you, for yourself and your children. He also expressed wishes for his son to inherit and hold dearly his vast collection of music, movies, stamps, and art prints. He reminisced about the straight razor which he inherited from his grandfather, which he carelessly broke while using it as a screwdriver. Bob still held on to that broken razor his entire life because his grandfather wanted him to have it. Bob hoped that Chris would share his father's sentiment. I hope that you will not carelessly misuse, waste, or destroy the value of the many things I have collected for you. First, learn all about them, how to use them and enjoy them, their value, and how you can thoughtlessly waste their value. Then enjoy them as I have. For example, my very good stamp collection, or all the recorded popular music on cassette tape, VCR tapes, and records. My books on popular music, movies, entertainment. I wasn't gonna say much because I'm just trying to like remember to have this all sink in again. But actually, vinyl records for the first time since the 1980s have actually overtook the uh, the sale of CDs. I don't know what relevance that serves, but there you go. Painters, musical theater, ship models, my daylilies, gazebo, and dreams. This letter offers an insight into Bob's character as he feared that all he had accomplished over the course of his life may be lost. In 1989, during a weekly trip to the toy store with his mother, Chris picked up a GoBot up on display and slowly started to read out the text on the package, ending his six years of silence. Later that same year, Bob and Chris converted the shed in their backyard into a workshop, christening it the Dreaming Studio. Bob had hoped that he and his son would build things together there. He even commemorated the space with a plaque. Dreaming Studio of Mr. C and Lil C, where dreams do come true. However, when asked about it, Chris could not recall what, if anything, had been built there. It was instead mostly used by Barbara for storage. For Christmas of that year, he got a Nintendo Game Boy. This was also the year that the family got Patty Chandler, a Beagle Spitz mix which they picked up as a pup from their aunt Karina. Chris grew very attached to the dog, displaying a fondness and arguably a love rarely shown for anything or anyone else in his life. Yeah, in 1990, Bob co-hosted a jazz marathon on WTJU radio. During the program, he displayed his keen knowledge on 20s and 30s jazz music. Yeah, uh, also, yeah, don't want to spoil it. During the thing, program, but, uh... he displayed his keen... Well, there you are. Uh, was this regarding and in memory of Robert Franklin Janet Jr. September fourth, twenty six. Yeah, that that's not really a spoiler. I think again, people who know what's going to come into this, they know where this is going to come up. In knowledge on twenties and thirties jazz music. Okay, now we go on to performance number two, which is tight like that. This is November the ninth, nineteen twenty eight, with Chicago personnel, Tampa Reds, Hokum Jug Band. There's a great group of Chicago musicians. Featuring kazoo, guitar, and jug by Hudson Whitaker. Tampa Red's guitar, Thomas A. Dorsey is on the piano and the washboard. Frankie Halfpipe Jackson. Vocals interact to make this a great session. Listen for some very good kazoo and jugs. And notice how Halfpipe Jackson laughs like scat singing. Very unusual. Nineteen ninety also marked the last year of Chris's tenure at Greene County Primary School. For his fourth grade studies, he transferred to Nathaniel Green Elementary School. It was here where he allegedly had very distressing experiences. He asserts that the staff at the school didn't know how to handle autistic children and treated him cruelly. Chris contends that five members of staff abused him by pinning him down to the ground, holding his wrists and ankles, and audiotaping his cries. Furthermore, 
He claimed that the principal forced him to sit on his lap and said offensive things to him. But little Christopher resisted, and the advances never went further than that. The principal is also claimed to be gay, which Chris feels justifies his homophobia. I was abused by one. A homosexual principal at my elementary school slapped me on his lap, said some offensive things to me, and I felt uncomfortable. Even though Chris's accounts of the events could not be verified, it is also not unlikely that an event like this could have taken place. Though Chris never specified the reasoning behind their attacks, nor did he state whether him being restrained and being assaulted by the principal were separate or related events, it is possible that he may have been restrained and verbally abused as a form of disciplinary action and even placed in a scream room, which was a fairly common school installation for dealing with autistic children up until the mid-1990s. Whatever events transpired, it forced Chris's parents to take him away from Nathaniel Green Elementary School. To further things, they took the case to Green County Court. After the school board threatened to take Chris out of mainstream education and instate him into a special needs school, the Chandlers dropped the case. For the remainder of the school year, he was homeschooled. It was around this tumultuous time that young Christopher had an uplifting experience that would change his life. During a shopping trip in Richmond, possibly in December 1992, but in other accounts he stated that it was 1989, he came across the Leonard Bernstein Symphony Orchestra, a show comprised of animatronic characters that is held around Christmas time at the Regency Square shopping mall. The conductor, Leonard Bernstein, is made to be fully interactive with his audience with the help of a human controller behind the scenes. On this blessed day, the turnout for the show was weak so Chris got extra attention from the bear. When Leonard asked him his name, the person controlling the animatronic misheard it and answered back, calling him Christian. The boy took this as a profound sign and felt that he should be called Christian. Wait, hang on a minute. Has he got uh, the, the, the Power Rangers, uh, the Ninja Megazord in the background? And it's got and it's got the Falcon Zord on the back as Congratulations, gr congratulations, Christian. The one thing I'm actually kind of jealous of you about. <laughs> wow. Like, if, if what would the value of something like that go for? I mean, that must have been uh, 92... Wait, no. That I think Chris was... I think he's like about, like, what, 40? That must have been when it just came out as well. That would have been almost new. But... God damn it. <laughs> Felt kind of that he should be called Christian. In order for Chris to continue with formal education, Bob and Chris moved to Chesterfield County while Barbara remained in the family house in Rutgersville with Patty so she could keep working. Christian enrolled in Providence Middle School in Richmond. He looked back fondly over his time here, giving special credit to his teacher Virginia Sanford. She was the most influential teacher in my life. During my years at Providence Middle School, she taught me better social skills how to better cope with other people, bullies, and life. With a positive and fun tomboyish attitude, she was a teacher any child would be most proud to look up to and be taught by. He also forged a friendship with Natasha Turner, a girl a few years older than him. He lost romantic interest in her when he saw her smoking. They would often hang out together at the bus stop. He would sometimes give her money on behalf of his father for her friendship and attention. Chris would later realize that Natasha was, in a sense, a friend with benefits. She would stay with him and be friendly in exchange for a monetary reward from Bob. Bob knew that his son had little hope in forming true friendships otherwise. The Avengers, the Sonic the Hedgehog, the cool new TV show is on the air. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll pause it out for one second, but that's, that just, that's, that's, that sounds that sounds more dreadful than it sounds. That you have to pay for people to talk to you. I mean, even at a young... And guys, listen. If you, you know me, I, you know that I have Asperger's Syndrome myself. And listen, I, it's, it's very well known that when you want to talk about the autism spectrum, including people with Asperger's, the spectrum is so wide, it's, it's probably 
it's a it's a it's about as far it's about like the distance from here to the moon in terms of how severe a case can be but i don't think christian is necessarily that bad at trying to communicate like there were days i feel i feel like i could barely utter a word to anyone but you know what i did so all the same because and i feel like this is something bob probably should have told chris himself but sometimes in life you just kind of have to get on with it and again now listen in the in the case of trying to make friends is that yeah it's not man it's not compulsory to make friends but you're gonna find out it, it it should be what he feels comfortable with and and i and i don't believe the idea that paying somebody just so that you to get attention especially of I'm, I'm assuming of uh attractive females in the eyes of chris is the way of going about this you it, it's I, I know Bob was trying to do the right thing, but sometimes the right thing from he sees it, he sees it is not the right thing in the bigger picture. In the fall of 93, Sega, the video game developer, held a watch and win sweepstakes contest in conjunction with their Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. The lucky winner would get a $1,000 shopping spree at KB Toys. And that winner was Chris. Christian is one of only about a hundred winners nationally to receive one thousand dollars worth of Sega games. Sonic Spin forty nine ninety nine. What's that in like today's? Can you get stuff like Event Horizon on discount on the PS four store, or something like Red Dead Redemption two? Or you could probably get both games for that. So, wow, just forty nine. I'm 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 absolutely stunned. Because you could freaking get Sonic Spin on the uh, the Sonic Mega Collection for the old PS2, pre Sonic Heroes of 2003, and it's charging 40. Wow, that the that's 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 an, that's just amazing. And equipment for his parents. It's just another example of how well he's doing. Christian is a high functioning autistic child. This past fall, on his own initiative, he entered a contest based on a favorite cartoon character. I had to do was exactly what Sonic the Hedgehog a cartoon and I'd listen to what Sonic says at the end of it and write it down for a whole week and then I had to mail it in and I had to be drawn out of a hat and I just won. And Christian's father says it only takes a few hours for him to master an electronic game and then move on to another. I can't master any of them. That's it for now. And it's this is the first of many competitions that he entered during his life and has cemented itself as a likely key reinforcer to his future sense of entitlement. A lot of things on December 29th, 1993, the Richmond Times Dispatch published an article about Christian's magical encounter with Leonard Bernstein entitled, It Took a Talking Bear to Give the Name a Young Boy Loves. The boy's father recounts the events of the day. Since this was early in the Christmas season, on a Thursday afternoon, the crowd was light. The conversation between Leonard and Christopher lasted about an hour. Christopher was spellbound. Something unusual happened during that conversation. When Leonard Bernstein, in a decidedly British accent, asked Christopher his name, the bear must have misunderstood what the boy replied. Leonard started calling our son Christian. What better name for the Christmas season? And the name stuck like glue. From that time on, for the past year, his name has been Christian Weston Chandler. Christian is very... Again, I'm just going to say this probably verbatim, that deciding the, the name of your song on, on what a bear says to you in one, af one afternoon, that seems like a pretty rash thing to do over... I'm misunderstanding, but whatever, you know. Again, you know, considering how well Christian keeps up with the ideas of religion and what he makes of God in general, uh, we'll find out. Very emphatic about that. Bob also offered up some insights into the family's situation. Christopher is a high-functioning autistic child. While intellectually his age level is 12 or 13, socially he is around age seven or eight. He has some behavior problems with his peers and relates better with children a few years younger than him. The Green County school system was not equipped to teach an autistic child, Mr. Chandler said. The Chesterfield County school system has accepted him with open arms. The article also mentions that Bob had originally wanted to name his son Christian but had chickened out. It is unclear what scared him off from naming his child Christian. In any case, the following year, 
the boy had his name legally changed to Christian Weston Chandler. In the spring of 96, Barbara retired from her secretarial position at Virginia Power and moved in with Bob and Chris, reuniting the boy with Patty the dog. In late spring, Chris graduated from Providence Middle School. As a parting gift, Mrs. Sanford wrote a personal, touching, and prophetic letter to Chris. Well, it's been three years now at Providence, and it's all over. Where has the time gone to? The most important parting words I can leave you with, well, are to always remember this. You show people where your weak points are located, then they will know how to push your button. If you never show them, they will never know. I hope you will have an enjoyable summer and come back to visit. Do your very best at Manchester, put your best foot forward, and treat others as you wish to be treated. Love, Mrs. Sanford. The Manchester in question happened to be Manchester High School, where, according to Christian, he spent the happiest years of his life. Over the course of four semesters, he studied Spanish, of which he has a very loose grasp. For class assignments, he adopted a Spanish name, Ricardo, a common practice for students in order to better get into character and the culture of the language. However, Christian got too into character and often used Ricardo in class assignments outside of Spanish and even considers it as part of his real name. When riding on the school bus, he used to sit right in front of the bus door so he could always get off the fastest. However, during his freshman year, he got into an altercation with another boy who wanted to be off the bus first. He punched Christian in the face, knocking his glasses off. In order to resolve the issue, Chris was forced to take the special ed bus to school from then on, which deeply affected him. He always felt very uncomfortable associating with others whom he called slow in the minds. I ended up with this really worse off mentally challenged person who could hardly ever speak other than err. Now, one, I'm just gonna, I'm, again, one, that's... That doesn't look very good on Christian's uh, point of view from uh, from talking to people who are obviously f in a far worse scenario than Chris is. But again, I'd, and I'm not I'm not going to speak. Out, I'm not really going to defend Christian on this. But I will say is that if I was Christian, I would feel as if like I've I've been on I've been on the the, the on the bus with the other kids uh, for so long and. Because I got punched in the face, I now have to take uh, the special ed bus. Now I don't, I, I don't know exactly what you guys would think about that, but I'd feel, I, I wouldn't even know what to think about that. I get punished for getting punched in the face for, for seemingly something so trivial. But then again, maybe this was just part of Chris's routine, and this is what people need to understand: is that uh, people with autism, people with Asperger's. And I've had very long conversations with uh, people about this. I, I like having a routine. I like something being in place so it removes disasters or it, or it makes things easier for everybody else involved. And maybe just what this, just having to take the, a different bus just sort of like got it got in the way, if that makes sense. It's It's important to like keep these things in mind because... Even if it doesn't make Chris look any good, in in any which way, I feel like it's the only re it's the only way to like get an insight into the into his way of thinking, which is something that's going to be brought up again a lot during these videos. That boy bopped me on the back of the head for his own laughs. The special ed teacher who rode on the bus talked with his brother about it, and he kept him from bopping me, but having to put up with his nonsensical slur talk was still just as cringy and horrifying. Ugh. Among his other activities, he served as a water boy and allegedly a manager for the school basketball team, the Manchester Lancers, along with Joseph Herring, one of Christian's only male friends. Chris had always gravitated towards girls, and at Manchester, this was no exception. He had a sizable group of female friends, which he dubbed Gal Pals. Among the first that he met was Molly Quarles, a cheerleader at the time whom he met as a freshman. He fondly remembered them being paired up during a matchup event for Valentine's Day. Laura Beth Dorazio was another cheerleader Chris met and fell for, but after he confessed that he had a crush on her, 
She told him that she would like them to remain just as friends. Tiffany Gowan was said to be a real good girl to Chris, and he has described her as a bit of a tomboy and a peppermint patty to his Charlie Brown. Kelly Andes was his biggest crush and says they were high school sweethearts, even though they were never in an actual relationship together. Sarah Bevel was- Yeah, again, I, I don't want to like spoil things too much, but it, Chris thinking people that are in relationships is another thing that's going to be coming up in about in a, in, a, in a there's a lot of videos to go but that's something that comes up was in the same chemistry class along with kelly and chris sarah had a boyfriend at the time and chris watched them interact hoping to experience that kind of relationship one day it was fun to just watch them flirt with each other i could have learned from that but my autism and normal social phobias held me back then miranda mitchell was the big brain in his circle of friends and shared computer graphics class with Christian. His group of gal pals were possibly not genuinely interested in a friendship with Chris, but rather stayed with him out of pity or as protection. A later comment made by Chris suggests that the group had made an arrangement with Bob and or the principal of the high school. Concerning schoolwork, there is a wealth of information that has been attained which helps to refute his previous claims that he held an honor roll streak all throughout high school. For one of his assignments, he had to conduct an interview with his parents, offering some more information about their life experiences. For the question, why did you choose to have children? I can barely understand that, but what is that? Is that it's nice to have birds, bits, babies? Is that what that's supposed to be? They answered, it's nice to have kids. Oh, For okay. what adjustments did you have to make after your first child arrived? They answered, Laughter from four kids and three situations, referring to the troubled past marriages and estranged children. Fifty points out of what? But also, these seem like very one-sentence answers. The idea is that you're supposed to have at least like four to five lines. I did this shit all the way through my my GCSE years, basically between the years of four of fourteen to sixteen. Interestingly, when asked about what has been the hardest part about parenting, the answer was dealing with the school system. In another assignment concerning families, Chris inserted mathematical equations into his definitions, making them hard to read and understand. For example, he defined a nuclear family as a mother, father, and X is more than or equal to one child sharing the same household. He also described adoption as a right to raise a child. I love the fact that also he crosses out three and decides to write, name and describe three ways of becoming a parent. He could only come up with two. Considering what Chris's uh, true ambitions are, you're about to work out why he only wants to write two and not go the whole hog and write three. ...who is biologically their own. Christian took part in a parenting exercise in which he wore an empathy belly to simulate the feeling of being a pregnant woman. He wrote a report describing his experience. Having a belly like a pregnant woman was really an awkward experience. When I tried to get my pencil bag out of my backpack, the belly held me back by putting pressure on my left leg. Luckily my arms were long, but if they were any shorter, I would have had a real problem to reach the pencil bag. While I was sitting in my chair, the belly made it uncomfortable for me to cross my legs, and while my legs were separated, it put pressure on my private part, which gave me a strange, weird feeling. He wrote an essay about Japan's involvement in World War II. Oh my god, and this essay is about the Second World War. And frigging Chris, what's that? Is that 1912 to 1949? That's, that's gonna include both wars. Oh boy, I'm up. Oh boy. It should be noted that he addressed himself as Ricardo W. Chandler, with Christian placed in parentheses, and wrote English in Spanish. The teacher justly corrected this. According to Chris, the war was a very tragic event, with guns, insults, and yuck. Guys, guys, let, let me just, let me make this, let me, let me fill you in on what I know about history. I did history at GCSE. I didn't pass history at GCSE. Not because I didn't know the information, but because 
uh, I, for whatever reason, like the exam was like, I freaking couldn't answer this exam properly because it was something about how does uh, picture B, how is it relevant? Is it informative? And th- 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 there was, it, it was, a, it was the sort of thing that I wasn't quite used, to, wasn't quite used to in terms of like doing other essays and stuff like that. I think if I could reset my uh, GCSE history classes, that's talking about uh, the Roaring Twenties, the Wall Street Crash, uh, p- post uh, World War Two Great Britain. I reckon I could do it just like that. Guns, insults, and yuck. The s- the essay is about the Second World War, where the USA went against Germany and Japan. Uh, I would have thrown the Russians in there. I would have possibly. I, w- I, d- I don't really particularly think the Chinese were would have been, they were technically a very anti-Chinese because the Chinese were sort of like being invaded by the by the by but th- that that was during the Russian Revolution. Okay, that's that's a that's a different matter. <laughs> He continues, The Japanese and Americans had deemed glowering at each other like boxers from opposite corners of a 5,000 mile ring. Oh boy. You know, yeah, have you guys ever heard of the phrase, you write in the same way that you speak? Yeah, I, I, I somehow, I, if you could picture Chris saying this, then he would write it down. It gives you a, a bit of it like an answer. I can, I s- but I see where he's coming from here. But unfortunately, he's not writing a very colourful piece of uh, journalism for the for the for the twenty first century to uh, look back and marvel at. This is just meant to be an an essay about uh, about Japan in the second or, or whatever it was. They say, he said Japan nineteen twelve to forty nine. I have no idea if this is meant to be a a piece on Japan or it's meant to be a piece on Japan in the Second World War. I don't I don't know that. There's a bit of context out of this. Maybe we'll we'll go along that 5,000 mile ring to find it. Waiting for the bout to begin. So, the US and Japan really wanted to get it on. Oh. He also quoted that President Woodrow Wilson tried to get Japan to withdraw from Shandong. Christian's essay... Okay, one. Windrow was... Japan... What was this? Uh... The Japanese were. Well, yeah, let's let's take that. Back. President Woodrow Wilson tried to get Japan to withdraw from Shandong. I'm pretty sure Shandong was the Second World War. Woodrow Wilson was the First World War. He was president in 1914. I, 1914, I think it was. I know that Wilson was definitely prime minister, what well, president, I should say, uh, during the beginning of World War One. Uh, what else has he got? Christian. During the wait for the start of the war, well, which one's that, Chris? He seems to have gone both wars kind of mixed up here. The Japanese were cloistered on their remote islands with little beyond, with little contact beyond the sea. Well, technically, he they, technically the Japanese did have contact, but the Japanese and the Chinese hate each other. Liter- literally, that's not even me making a joke. They absolutely cannot stand each other. They deem themselves as a superior race, okay, and the rest of the world as barbarians. Not entirely sure. War against Japan, page eight. I, I'm going to assume that, that... Is that the first time Chris ever tried to cross-reference something? Well, it couldn't have been because he got it wrong. But the real barbarians were the Japanese people themselves. Okay, I think, I think, I've, got, I think I've got the idea. This essay ended up being a mishmash of events of both world wars. In addition, he referenced several books, however all of his findings could be found within the first eight pages. Oh my the teacher commented, restate thesis. There is a page titled Warm Fuzzies for Christian W. Chandler, which most likely was a class activity in which the students wrote nice things to each other in order to promote acceptance. The messages left for Chris read very bland, such as, I like your clothes, is a very funny and nice person. Okay. okay, funny, you are a nice person, nice watch, you tell great jokes, and you tell fun jokes. But perhaps the most baffling piece of writing that there is on record is his 13 lucky writing tips, an assignment for English class in which he switches four tips in to what most closely resembles Spanish. In any case, it is little more than unintelligible garble. Oh. Use standard written English. 
Do not use contractions in formal writing. You must have a thesis statement in each essay. The thesis statement is el finale estancia de introductori paragrafe. Tu escribes de literature. El thesis include el llama de author y llama de work. Los paragraphs support y relate cue el thesis. Los paragraphs tienes el topic estancia. Guys, I'm by a lot of things, but lingual is not one of them. In fact, actually, speaking of that, the last time I had a French class was six years ago, 2014. And even and I reckon not having a and not having a class for the last six years, I still reckon I could have a fair crack of the whip at trying to uh, write a, a French piece like uh, top 13 writing tins. Uh, Samos Salos Blia, Samos Gardeval Sans Soute, Quilt Up Machine, Quilt Le Devo, you know, you know, etc, etc. I'm not entirely sure. Well, it's a good thing Gino can understand this. I can't friggin' read any of this. It's a pity that uh, he didn't include make sure people can understand your writing. That's usually quite key for a writing tip, I reckon. Says, Ablan el unifying concepto de el paragraph. Los details support y relate a el topic estance de paragraph. Necesitas los adecuate support details. Escribe el literatore el presente tense. Necesitas tres muchaco mirar de puente. Necesitas creas muy bien tu escribes creas sense y es muy logical. Cheques tu escribir muy carefully. From the school report. It can be seen that he failed all but two of his 14 assignments, oh, earning right. a D plus for the year. What an earth was an At age 16, Chris wrote a poem entitled Song of Christian for his class, loosely based on Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. He decided to record his creation for posterity in video form. The video itself is poorly lit, but there isn't much to see anyway. I hear America singing as I sing of myself. And you experience as I experience. The problems of yourself are my problems. The youth of the young singing cries a happiness. The children's song is song of laughter. At age six weeks, I sang the song of laughter. That at one and a half years of age, the Lord put the mute button on me. My song that I sing, although I talk well, my peer relationship is low and my loneliness is off the scale. Anyway, that's my poem. Beyond just reciting the poem, he pretends to be the enthusiastic host of the Christian Chandler Show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Christian Chandler Show. We get lots of laughs and all that neat old stuff. And now here he is, the host of the most Christian Chandler. Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Christian Chandler Show. I am your host, Christian Chandler. He then rambles on about his fascination with the Sonic the Hedgehog universe and talks about Bionic the Hedgehog, his first Sonic-related creation, which he came up with during basketball practice. And then I have science friend that helps, of course, tails that flies, knuckles he punches and climbs, and Bionic, well, you heard rumors about Bionic. He's that science brother I met myself, who's that very good basketball player and mechanic. Uh, I can tell you the background story on him. He proceeds to rant about receiving an F in English class. I see by God, that's about time I sign off. But uh, before I go, I just one thing to say to uh, the teacher. An F in English class? You have got to be kidding me. I mean an F. I do not even know when was the last time I got an F. I mean, who knows? It could have been back in old Green County. That stupid place. Yeesh. That Green County primary. Actually, it was a nice school, but <laughs> then it came the thing of Green Elementary. That's why I like. Maybe he had something to do with the fact that you were shoving friggin' Spanish gibberish into your work, Chris. Maybe that's why. Like, did nobody tell him that you, you shouldn't be doing these things? I mean, I get the idea that, you know, some point you got to just let him get on with in fact, I, I think I know what happened. Somebody did tell Chris, but he chose to totally ignore them. Maybe that's what happened. Or maybe he just got told that too much, and he didn't understand why, and he just continued with it anyway. Hence, ZF.
So I got the app. Anyway, that many years go by. Then you came along and gave me a nap. I may have started off with a night and you just lowered it, lowered it, lowered it. I'm getting sick and tired of this lower thing. What do you have against all, against the handicapped children anyway? I mean, I know my handicap is autism and I'm not afraid to admit it. And you, Mrs. Bird, I think that F is very disrespectful. I mean, I am very emotional about it. Anyway, it's time I sign off. Well, this has been the Christian Channel Show. Around the same time, he made a series of stop-motion videos of races set in his Lego-made town called Quickville, based on his own initials. They were made with a Game Boy camera, which produced grainy, low-resolution grayscale photos, or, alternatively, low-quality stop-motion video. The awkward frame rate makes it difficult to discern what is actually going on. But it is important to note that all the racers are named either after pop culture characters that Christian idolized, or people he knew in real life. This is the earliest account of Chris using people to play out his fantasies. The biggest trend in kids' toy history, it's multi-multi-billion dollar. Throughout the late 1990s, the Pokemon franchise was spreading across North America, with Chris keeping a keen eye on it. He began playing the trading card game, and included illustrations of Pokemon characters in his Spanish homework. He also wrote a lengthy essay detailing how the Pokemon came into their Pokeballs, with which his teacher was very pleased. The year 1999 marked the birth of his Wall of Originals. This was a designated portion of the wall which displayed Pokemon trading cards that Chris made himself. It featured original Pokemon such as a female Pikachu called Chikachu and Plotistic, a plant which is autistic. Chris himself also appeared several times. His fascination grew to a point that he would dress up as the Pokemon character Ash Ketchum out in public. Around mid-1999, Christian launched his first website, a simple Pokemon-themed effort humbly called Quick's Pokesite, cementing the moniker Quick. It was soon replaced by Quick's Pokesite 2 with a new logo designed by Miranda. He updated it with personal and Pokemon-related news here, semi-regularly, for the next year and a half. This year also marked Christian's first visit to The Game Place, a game and hobby store which allowed returning customers to play video games, board games, or trading card games. It quickly became his weekly haunt. The Pokemon craze was captured on film for Richmond's NBC affiliates WWBT News. The report featured excited young kids playing the game and trying to explain the phenomenon. How do you play the game? I can't explain, it's too long. Their bewildered parents standing witness. Um, I'm watching and, and uh, I still have no clue. <laughs> and the 17 year old Chris in action. I'll switch, I'll put out my dragon there, even though it has 60 damage on it. Oh boy. And I have three energy on it. Slam attack. So if you had the time to tell me. To commemorate Valentine's Day of the year 2000. Can I just make a point about uh, Pokemon just for a second? When was the the last time? Because Pokemon was pretty popular when I was uh, in in uh, primary school and secondary school. It was it was a sort of thing that people were interested in. Just it was a select sort of group of people. Like. When was when is when do you think we're ever going to see a phenomenon like that? I mean, when when do you think the next day somebody's going to come up with an idea that's going to just change the game forever? Because at this moment, Pokemon as it stands has no real competition because it it is so vastly superior to anything anything that comes close to trying. Digimon was has its followers but it's not going to be it's not going to like threaten pokemon anytime soon uh i mean think about i mean Mar i mean the mario franchise has been around longer but think about how much pokemon has really expanded itself uh not only in games tournaments trading card games plushies toys a a disneyland inspired theme park in japan there's you you get you get the idea that there's there's just, there's just so much it it went and so much it, it it's it's a cultural phenomenon. 
in and outside Japan. Kind of like Dragon Ball Z or Bleach or One Piece. Christian wrote a Valentine's Day hymn, a free verse effort in which he reveals that he holds very traditional views on courtship and the predetermined rules of etiquette for men and women. On a date, the man could not pay the bill. Oh yeah, see how see how that goes for you, Christian. That's don't pay men, don't pay the bill. Yeah, don't be a simp, guys. Chris friggin' predicted the future. Don't be a simp. It's oh boy. So his date slammed her door in his face. The man's coat over a puddle. The maiden walks. Then the man trips and pays the laundry bill. Under the moonlight, the couples of the world kiss. But unfortunately for a few, they are interrupted by their parents. He uploaded it onto his website. Oh. Ten days later, Chris celebrated his 18th birthday, a date which he held in the highest regard. Among the guests in attendance were a handful of Christian's gal pals and his half-brother Cole. Nearly three years after the fact, he reminisced about the event. I will never forget my 18th birthday party. It was the best of the rest. The weekend before my real birthday, my mother and I prepared for the party I was going to host that day. We hung balloons and streamers, and we laid refreshments on the table. At the door was four of my high school amigas, and one of them brought a friend. We ate pepperoni pizza and drank Pepsi. It was great. As mother lit the candles, I was filling up with ecstasy. After I blew the candles, I was presented with a big jawbreaker from Kelly, an R.L. Stein novel from Sarah, a planer with stickers from Miranda, and a rabbit doll with jelly beans from Tiffany. We watched Good Burger and had fun. After they left, it was done. Good Burger was a trash movie. I'm, 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 I call it as I see it. What did I wish for? I'm not telling. Even though he seemed pleased that his gal pals came to celebrate, he was never pictured together with them, preferring to sit alone. He is also photographed wearing a pair of jeans with a suspicious stain on his crotch. Some have speculated that it is dried semen, but it is unlikely. About a month later, Chris was tasked with designing a CD jewel case for his graphic design class. On the fateful day on March 17th, 2000, I wanted to feature on my favorite hit CD cover, lifelong hero Sonic the Hedgehog and cute newer character Pikachu, but copyrighted characters were prohibited from the project. So in my mind, I pondered and pondered when it hit me visually, Sonic and Pikachu combined. In a way to escape copyright, he combined Sonic the Hedgehog and Pikachu to create Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon, which Christian considers to be one of his greatest life accomplishments. The CD tracklist itself consists of Pokemon, Sonic and Mario related music, with intermittent appearances of old time jazz from artists such as Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby, undoubtedly an influence from his father. Another month later, Chris had to document a week of his life for a school project. The result was A Week with Christian W. Chandler, a self-documentary, which detailed the events of his life from April 29th to May 5th, 2000. The front cover features a blurry photo of Chris and Patty, with a discolored ghostly Sonic below. He writes it in the third person, as if followed by a documentary crew. On April 29th, he visits Books A Million to participate in the Pokemon Trading Card Game League. Afterwards, he enters a costume contest, and since he wore his regular Ash Ketchum outfit, he wins and receives a cool t-shirt as a reward. The following day, he talks about packing and moving things from their home in Richmond to their old house in Rutgersville. The next day, he goes to high school. He uses a tripod to help take pictures of himself. During class, Mr. Goss discussed the difference between Shakespeare's world and the real world of today. Christian rested his eyes after Mr. Goss's discussion and before the bell rang. Next, he had trigonometry. I'd hate to be Christian when his nerves kicked into action after waking up from a naughty snooze cruise, but I was. Next was computer graphics. It was great for him today because he got to print his own CD cover. Next was Spanish too. He took a quiz today, but I think he feels confident in his work. And finally, after a hard odd day, he rides home on a bus. But unfortunately, 
It had a few slow in the minds on it. The following day, he repeats the routine of snoozing through class, and that on even days, he eats lunch with Tiffany and Sarah. For the following day, he describes his daily activities at home, which mostly consist of playing video games and managing his website. The next day, he talks about working in computer graphics class and making a Mother of the Year award for Barbara, which he plans to give to her on Mother's Day. For the final day's report, Chris states that it was a difficult Friday. One of his duties included taking part in a senior group photo. After the long wait for the pictures to be taken, being crowded like a sardine surrounded by immature teenage boys, and having the hot, hot sun shining down on him and everyone else, he went back to the shady entrance. After the photo shoot, Chris was picked up by his dad. And that concludes our week-long documentary of A Week with Christian W. Chandler, the autistic boy that has made it this far. Colon close parentheses. Chris wouldn't pass up an opportunity to go to the senior prom, so he did, bringing his mother along as a date. Even though Christian had labeled the set of photos as the senior prom, it is possible that it was some other social gathering due to the fact that the event is held during the daytime. Looking back on the prom, he claimed that he was naive about dating, unlike the other students. What, you mean at this point or all the way through? I, I, I don't quite... Well, okay, whatever. Out of pity or out of genuine compassion, Tiffany asked Christian to dance. I hesitated at first, but she grabbed my hand and pulled me onto the dance floor. We danced for what felt like hours. It was the most pleasant experience of that night, and I thank her for dancing with me then. He felt that her willingness to dance with him meant that she was attracted to him, and stated that if they were to meet again, they would start a relationship. Graduation. The end of high school. The end of his interactions with his gal pals. Most importantly, it was the day Christian had to be recognized for his achievements, but unfortunately, this wasn't the case. I only got recognized for my grades with a star pin, yet they had more fancier awards for more important qualities. I should have been highly recognized for my artistic talents I showed in my many art classes for the award ceremonies before graduation day. I felt crestfallen greatly from not getting recognized for any of my talents. I excelled in math too for the love of God. I was so f jealous. I was a high-functioning autistic boy who came way beyond out of his social shell only to get zilch, nada, zip, a big fat zero. I felt- Chris, you somehow, you mistook, uh, for things about Japan for both world wars, Chris. Trust me, I'm, I'm, and also the things about the writing and then adding abstract to Spanish phrases. Chris, I'm going to say this, and I've gotten bad grades before, but I recognise that there were things I could have done better. I think everybody recognises, or at least eventually realises that everyone, we, we could, we could all do better. But again, th what you're going to find out through later videos and. If it wasn't obvious already, Chris's uh, idea to, you know, uh, self, uh, to being self-aware and recognizing where he went wrong are not in his, uh, are not his strong suits. I felt so devastated and out of sync. Devastated. As a result of his heartbreak, he only went up on stage to receive his diploma without looking at anyone's face nor shaking anyone's hand. Yeah. After the ceremony was over, he found himself an unoccupied table, sat by it and cried. Eventually, his mother and later Tiffany came to console him. His father would look back on this event with shame and anger for years to come. Christian's time at high school is still thought of fondly by him, recalling his sweet memories of creating artistic projects for class and frequently hanging out with his gal pals, all of which were abruptly ended with that gloomy, rainy graduation. But with the end of high school, came the promise of a new world in college, a chance for new friends, new experiences, and the first steps to a brighter future.
and that ladies and gentlemen is going to do it for part one it's I still feel very very conflicted about a, about a couple of things because I think we've got like a, a good while to go before we uh, sign off here ladies and gentlemen what's the time ne oh nearly 11 o'clock okay we've got a I say we've got about 10 minutes. Okay, so let's see what we can get through in 10 minutes. Part 1 is the part I'm going to always recognize in all of the uh, in all of uh, Chris Chandler comments of history. It's always going to be the part where I feel as if like for me it's probably one of the most relatable parts. Uh his early his upbringing, his uh years in high school, education, relationships relationships uh, and whatnot and I gotta I got and I gotta say this right now ladies and gentlemen there's a lot of things and I suppose you I can't really blame Chris a great deal for the problems he had uh growing up because when you when you're a child you, you, you don't you don't think in a very conscientious manner. Or to, some well, some people do, but it's sometimes you just kind of like have to. You, you seem to like think a little bit more. I, I want to say think a little bit more plainly. You feel as if like this doesn't make sense, and you're not afraid to voice your opinion. And Chris, well, one as you can see right there, he does that a lot in his childhood. But what you're gonna find out later on, ladies and gentlemen, is that he does this a lot in his future as well, and. Unfortunately, just because you can say stuff, it does not mean you should. And that's something that literally haunts Chris for years and years to come. And what's also just as sad when you look back at all of this is that even if we're, even if he didn't admit, if he didn't know at the time that the only reason his gal pals were hanging around with him because uh, Rob Bob was uh, paying them. He he still enjoyed himself. He was still. He was happy. That's. That's the friggin. That's the. That's like the the saddest and also the best part about this is that, he was happy. He was in his. He was in his own little bubble. He was discovering a lot of stuff about Pokemon, about Sonic. He was enjoying his life as, innocent as a child, because. Yeah, that that's something that I think a lot of people will pick up upon in the next couple of, in the uh, in the future is that there are some parts where you could say Chris obviously is basically just a child who never grow grows up. Unfortunately, and I, and this is going to be a little bit of a spoiler for part forty three is that the idea of comparing Chris to a child does not really make a great deal of sense because there are consequences that because of the actions that Chris does that have very real world consequences and you can't you can't fall back on the pretext of being a child because well he he isn't and there's and I and again I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler for a couple of other there's going to be in the future ladies and gentlemen where you're going to see various parts of me doing reactions to these you're going to be seeing a lot of things that I can sort of see where the logic is, but other times there's going to be stuff where I could not condone or endorse. Just as like Gino said in the disclaimer in the beginning, there are just some things that you just don't do, and there are some things you just do not push for. There, there was that. I've I've always sort of like wanted to get my brother and sister and quite possibly my parents as well to watch some of these well watch the actual Gino Samuel videos because I think this is at some point in the future when and where Christian Western Chandler passes away I don't care what he says in that in that analysis anarch anarchy uh, red versus blue that he did a few days ago he's not immortal and I'm pretty sure the day Chris realizes that is going to be one of the few days we last see Chris. But the important, but the important point about all of this is that it's going to be a part of history. Chris is a part of history 
as much as anyone else, as much as you, you right there, you watching this are a part of history as well. Not of history, but a part of history. A lot of people who document, talk, analyse, have anything to do with Chris whatever, and having anything to do with Chris isn't exactly uh, a proud thing. The idea is that you want to stay as far away from Chris's antics as possible. You only sort of like want to... The closest you should be to getting anywhere near Chris is from behind the screen. And even then, there are there are, there are complications by doing that as well. But... There, there, there's going to be parts uh, coming up where people go too far in uh, teasing Chris. There's going to be parts where Chris, Chris goes way, way too far in trying to get his chaotic and miserable life back on track. Also, that's going to be another bit of a spoiler. Chris's life, when you look back on it, and let's say uh, 24 videos time, you, you, you'll say that his life is nothing but an unmitigated disaster from one problem to another, literally day in, day out. But the important thing is that by learning from this, by learning exactly what Chris has done and what he hasn't done and all the mistakes he's made hopefully this in some way incites people that whilst obviously condoning his actions is wrong and doing what chris does is equally as bad it's a case it's a case study don't if you do this this and this you will end up like that that and that and that's it's it's a part of learning it's a part of making sure that well, we recognise that Chris is autistic, very high on the uh, autism spectrum at that, which if if there are problems uh, obviously arising from Chris, and there, there's you, you're going to see them on full display in the next, uh, in well, basically in this series, is that, and I'm going to finish this part off right now by saying this, is that the way you see Chris behave and the way you see him react and act upon the world you're gonna, I'm just going to say it is the result and and the cause of his autism. It is sometimes it's the result and not the cause, but this is the cause and the result. Because Chris has autism, Chris is going to see the world and interpret the world in these ways. What ways are we talking about? Well, join me in part two, ladies and gentlemen. And I will show you what I mean by because and effect, cause and effect. So, I thank all of you guys for watching this with me. Thank you so much, Mr. Genius Samuel, for letting me uh, react to this video. And I hope to all of you guys again in the next video. And I must say, ladies and gentlemen, just before we go off, you know what's really special about this video? This is the first video in nine i the last time i recorded a video was nine weeks ago and i gotta say now ladies and gentlemen i've missed doing these i think it's time to get back to work <laughs>